Are we addressing health disparities? Are we changing the patient experience um, with their care? And um, maybe thinking about success a little bit more broadly, we really need to focus in on targeted areas that we think have a higher likelihood of of this notion of health system transformation. And, and that really has informed the strategy that we laid out in 2021 for providers and administrators um, who've been hesitant to adopt value-based care. We're very attuned to these concerns. We appreciate the workforce challenges that really permeate our health system. Dr. Elizabeth Fowler is Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation at CMS. Dr. Fowler previously served as Executive Vice President of Programs at the Commonwealth Fund and Vice President for Global Health Policy at Johnson & Johnson. Before that, she was Special Assistant to President Obama on Healthcare and Economic Policy at the National Economic Council. Now we're really thinking about that integration and thinking more deliberately. I think we're not gonna put out models just you know, along each part of the um, spectrum, but really thinking about how they, they work together. Dr. Fowler has over 25 years of experience in health policy and health services research. She earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, a PhD from the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and a law degree from the University of Minnesota. She is admitted to the bar in Maryland, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Supreme Court. It has been easier to get providers at the primary care level into models, um, but we also don't want to ignore specialty care because that is where a lot of the spending takes place. This episode is part of the Healthcare Innovations series presented by Edwards Life Sciences. If you enjoy listening, please remember to subscribe to the show. Now, let's join the conversation as Dr. Fowler shares her insights. Well, good afternoon, Liz. Welcome. Thanks so much, Gary. Nice to be here. Why don't we move right into the CMS Innovation Center and your impressive leadership, of course. For those of us that may not be totally up to speed, would you describe the CMS Innovation Center for us, please, Liz? Sure, of course. Uh, the Innovation Center was part of the Affordable Care Act that passed in 2010, and it was designed as a novel approach for testing new healthcare payment and delivery system models um, in Medicare and then, to a lesser extent, Medicaid. Um, Don Berwick, a, a former CMS administrator and one of the nation's foremost experts on delivery system reform, described the Innovation Center as um, representing to the U.S. health system what NIH is to biomedical research. Um, and it really was, you know, when we were debating the ACA, there were an, a limited number of ideas and policies for imp improving quality and lowering cost. Um, and so, you know, those of us working on the legislation thought maybe the private sector was testing ideas that Medi Medicare should consider. So we have authority to waive um, Medicare regulations that get in the way of coordinating care or delivering care more efficiently. And I'll just give a couple of examples. In the context of an innovation center model, um, we have the ability, we had the ability to use, um, allow greater use of telehealth before the pandemic or waive the homebound requirements for delivering more care to patients at home or eliminate the three-day prior stay for nursing home care. We have the ability to permit flexibility to address social determinants of health, um, for example, nutrition, transportation, et cetera. So in other words, what are the barriers, the rules, the regulations that are standing in the way of care being more um, delivered more efficiently or effectively? And can we design a payment model or a care delivery system that eliminates those barriers? <laughs> Well, thinking back to the to the early days, of course, you're the chief health counsel of the Senate Finance Committee and uh, work with Senator Max Baucus. You really envisioned this center and got that into the uh, legislation, work with uh, our good friend Nancy Ann DeParle on that. Looking back on it, um, did you ever think you'd be the director of the center one day? Uh, no, I didn't. I, uh, I, w I didn't envision that, actually. Um... But I, I tell you, it's a fun job, and I've really enjoyed it. So um, just that ability to impact um, healthcare policy and hopefully make things better um, for patients and for the system. This is kind of, uh, I suppose, a tricky question. But looking back on it, now that you've been the director, uh, were there any changes that you wish you had made back then? Of course, without the foresight of... Uh, 
of seeing the uh, center in operation? Well, I'll, I'll maybe talk a little bit about the statutory language for success. So the statute defines success um, in terms of certification. So we want to improve quality or lower cost. Hopefully we do both. Um, but a model is certified when it has um, um, a likelihood of reducing healthcare spending on a net basis um, into the future. And, and if a model is certified, then it can be expanded in duration and, and scope through rulemaking. And I think maybe what we didn't realize is the way that it was drafted and the way it's been interpreted, that word certification really is a very high bar for success. And I think it doesn't necessarily, the way that we're defining success and have for the last 10 years, sort of belies the impact that we've had on health system transformation. So we're now trying to sort of step back and think more broadly about the impact we're having on the health system. And, you know, are we changing, are we addressing health disparities? Are we changing the patient experience um, with their care? And um, maybe thinking about success a little bit more broadly. We'll, we'll, of course, stay true to the statute because that's what it says we're supposed to be focused on, but really trying to redefine success and the outcomes for the model. What do you think about movement toward a value-based model, Liz? I mean, is this something that 10 years from now, do you think we'll be much further down this down the pike? Or what do you think about the timing of that? Yeah, well, I have definitely come to the conclusion that, you know, changing our healthcare system is a marathon, not a sprint, for right. sure. <laughs> I will say, you know, for the first 10 years of the Innovation Center, we planted a lot of seeds. It was sort of this um, fostered a lot of innovation um, and innovative approaches in a lot of different areas and took a lot of lessons from those models, but it really was sort of a let a thousand flowers bloom approach. And I think for the second decade, we really need to focus in on targeted areas that we think have a higher likelihood of of this notion of health system transformation. And and that really has informed the strategy that we laid out in 2021. Yeah. Um, we've really set that bold goal of having 100% of Medicare beneficiaries in an accountable care relationship with a provider who's responsible for total cost of care and quality. Um, and and so, you know, staying optimistic, I think it requires diligence, focus, and perseverance, but it also requires patience. You made the point you conducted a strategic refresh in uh, the fall of 2021 and a one-year update. Uh, just recently published that in November of 2022. Can you uh, share just a high-level view of those two documents and and what you were trying to accomplish with each of them? Sure. Well, I think, you know, part of this goes at, you know, I think it's the role and the responsibility of the Inno Innovation Center to really send a strong signal and a very consistent message about where we're heading um, so that, you know, the health system knows and can predict um, and make the necessary investments um, to, you know, to know where we're heading. So, um, that was part of the reason for the strategy we put out in 2021 that really focused, like I said, on accountable care as sort of the first strategic objective. The second strategic objective being around health equity. The third around supporting innovation. What are the tools um, and resources needed to really support that innovation? Um, addressing affordability, not just for the whole system and programs, but also for patients um, and, and their out-of-pocket costs. Right. And then finally, thinking about um, partnering to achieve system transformation and thinking um, more deliberately about um, multi-payer alignment. So that was what we laid out in um, 2021. And then in the fall in 2022, we published a one-year update. And thanks for asking about that. I think um, what we tried to do um, was really lay out how much we'd accomplished over the last year, um, laid out some highlights, for example, in accountable care, the ACO REACH model, um, we saw the ACO investment model incorporated into the Medicare Shared Savings Program. We announced a new oncology model, um, advancing health equity, um, some of the innovative payment approaches that we've um, been testing, and the requirement for a health equity plan for all our participants. Um, so we laid out our, our accomplishments and then really tried to think more about the metrics for success. So specifically in each of the five strategy areas, how are we going to determine whether we're making progress? And then if you're really into metrics, you can look at the technical paper we put out on 
you know, the baseline and how we're measuring interim progress and, and our 2030 goals. So that was the, the point of um, the one year update. And to be honest, I was really taken aback by how much progress we had made and, you know, the foundation and the building blocks, I think, setting us up well for 2023. Well, what kind of reaction did you receive from the field? I think I think there's um, it's been pretty positive, I would say. I think um, folks have really appreciated the um, way we're trying to be more transparent in, in what we're doing and, and doing a better job of communicating um, and sharing data and information. Why is it so difficult to uh, both create and implement models of accountable care? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, and I think um, we've got to think carefully about, um, you know, we've got the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which is a permanent feature of Medicare. It's run by the Center for Medicare, so not by the Innovation Center. I think what we're trying to do is really coordinate a lot more closely with our colleagues across CMS to make sure that what we're testing um, is relevant to the the sort of overall program, the Medicare Shared Savings Program. We've laid out a vision um, together um, with our colleagues in other parts of of the agency. And for those who don't follow CMS, you might not know, but we're siloed just like everyone else. And but we've really tried to break down some of those silos and and make sure that what we're doing is relevant for them and that and that we understand where they want to go next. Um, so we've. Um, laid out a vision. We call it the ACO visioning team. Um, and we've also been working really closely with the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Le Network or the LAN. Um, and we've, we've um, it's our main um, avenue for communicating and staying in touch with stakeholders across the system, payers, providers, health systems, purchasers, and, and patient organizations. And I spent a lot of time over the last year really defining what accountable care means and then if you look on their website, the LAND website has um, an accountable care um, commitment curve, sort of everything from sort of a, a learning system all the way up to an aligned system and a transformed system. And what are the tools and capabilities and outcomes that we're really looking for at each stage of that um, of that continuum? So I think we're laying this groundwork to try to more clearly define what we mean by accountable care. And it's not just we know it when we see it, but there are actual um, tying it to actual steps along the way. That's just terrific. Uh, let me shift a bit. I mean, the pandemic has obviously been distracting for everybody uh, in healthcare. And one thing it seemed to do is it really stopped um, the interest on the providers and I think some of the insurers in models of, I'll just call them value-based models. Um, now, we're still grappling with the pandemic, but we've been through it now for a while. Do you see this willingness to innovate uh, coming back at all? Yeah, it's a really good question. And we're still learning how COVID has impacted this movement of value-based care. I think what we do know is that providers and health systems that had invested in value-based care were more resilient during the pandemic. And we had hoped that we might be able to use this sense um, and momentum to bring others into the fold. But, you know, I, I think we have to be realistic. And we know that a lot of organizations are still facing ongoing challenges um, for providers and administrators um, who've been hesitant to adopt value-based care. We're very attuned to these concerns. We appreciate the workforce challenges that really permeate our health system. And, and it has been driving a need for more certainty more predictability and maybe makes providers a little bit more um, risk averse um, and nervous about jumping into a model. So it's our job to learn how we can meet organizations where they are and help bring them along and bring them into value-based care. And I think, Gary, if you, um, as we roll out new models this year, I hope you'll see we've spent a lot of time thinking about how to bring these new providers um, into alternative payment models. And we welcome continuous feedback and input on what more we could be doing. Bundled payments, which the Innovation Center has a lot of experience with it. And I think when that was first proposed, there was a lot of enthusiasm on the part of, of providers and insurers. Uh, the reality of it probably has um, uh, kind of got in the way of that enthusiasm, if you will. But where do we stand in in the field's view of bundled payments, just given how you, um, given the models that the, that the Innovation Center is uh, is implementing? 
Another really important question. Um, so in tandem with this, the release of the one-year report, we released a blog um, on the CMS website that outlines our specialty care strategy. And the blog talks about our strategy to testing models and um, and and really improve access to high-value um, specialty care. As part of that strategy, we explained that episode-based models like the bundle payments and CJR, the um, yep. comprehensive joint replacement model, play an important role in maintaining momentum in value-based care among hospitals and um, health systems. So we have announced a two-year extension of BPCIA Advanced, um, and this includes a new application opportunity, which will open in the coming weeks. And we see that as really a down payment on a more comprehensive specialty care strategy. You asked about receptivity to the models in the field, and we know that all models experience attrition, particularly voluntary models, and, and that's been the case with BIPSI um, throughout the course of the model. And we also appreciate that hospitals and health systems have been frustrated by the res retroactive adjustments or retrospective adjustments that were incorporated into the model before I got here, um, but they've made funding and revenue streams more unpredictable. Um, so we appreciate that perspective. We've announced changes to the program based on feedback, and we're looking at policies, um, those policies and the impact on participation, because it'll be important not just to the extension of the model, but also for future episode models um, that we hope to roll out soon. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. It seems to me that the focus on specialty care uh, has increased uh, in the last couple of years. Is that true, or is it just I wasn't focused on that before? <laughs> well, as we were um, drafting the specialty strategy, we looked back, and you will see over the past decades, Medicare beneficiaries have been um, faced with greater clinical and system complexity, and um, the number of specialists that a patient may see in a year has increased um, substantially. Um, and that really means increasing demands on primary care to try to coordinate um, all of this care. Um, but also for patients, it's been a challenge to navigate um, specialist care. So where, you know, we took all of that in mind um, in laying out the strategy um, that we put out last fall. Right. Are you at the point yet where you've detailed the financial structure or the financial incentives that would uh, coordinate primary care with specialty care? I think not in great detail. What we did was, and it was a blog, so, you know, somewhat limited in detail, but we laid out four key areas um, that we're going to um, be looking at into the future. And I'll just go through those really quickly. And these are part of the specialty strategy. Um, the first is enhancing transparency of specialist data and performance measures um, to increase access um, to high quality accountable specialty care and integration with primary care, so a data component. The second is, as I mentioned, maintaining that momentum established by the episode payment models um, by continuing to deploy acute care episode-based payment models that, and but we are thinking about how they align with ACOs and, and primary care. Um, third is supporting specialists to embed in primary care focused models so in the short term, this means exploring the use of e-consults, enhanced referrals, um, and advanced primary care models to improve access to specialty care and reduce waiting times. But in the longer term, it means establishing financial targets um, for high volume, high cost specialty care within population-based models. And then fourth, which is really a longer term strategy is creating a targeted send a, a set of financial incentives for ACOs to actively manage specialty care, for example, through um, episode cost and quality measures that are specific to specialist managed conditions. Um, so that we've laid it out in, in sort of broad strokes. And I think what we um, plan to do this year is fill in more detail. Uh, we're contemplating um, a request for information. What are those areas where we should be delving more deeply? Um, and we anticipate uh, getting a lot of input um, from ACOs in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, as well as from the general population and, and those who've engaged with us and those who are considering it. The term continuum of care encompasses a lot of the initiatives that that you've been talking about or the patient journey, I guess, would be another term that could, that could apply here. How do you think about continuum of care, Liz, and 
I'm thinking particularly about the data that would allow measurement and payment uh, for continuum of care. How do you think about that? Well, in my head, I have a picture of the patient journey from um, a patient who's generally healthy and should be receiving appropriate screening and preventive services to along that continuum, a patient with symptoms and a new diagnosis um, that may develop into a chronic condition or a more serious health event or episode of care. And then towards the other end of the spectrum, palliative care for patients with a terminal diagnosis. We laid out this picture um, in the in the specialty care blog if you if you want to see what's actually in my head. And and as we looked at the innovation center models, we've tested and invested in models across this continuum, from education and nutrition for pre-diabetics um, to models addressing social determinants to these episode models that we just discussed for discrete conditions and procedures to palliative care models. And now we're really thinking about that integration and thinking more deliberately. I think we're not going to put out models just you know along each part of the um, spectrum, but really thinking about how they they work together. Back to the specialist uh, primary care uh, discussion, and, and it would just strike me that primary care physicians or professionals of primary care would be more, more interested in value-based models than specialists. Have you found that or should be true? Or are you thinking about ways to address that? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think that's definitely true. There've probably been more models around spe- um, primary care, um, and 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 that's certainly where we're putting a lot of eggs in that sort of advanced primary care, accountable care bucket, if you will. Um, and and you know, it's not to say everyone's jumped in, um, but we are thinking about how to bring on, as I mentioned, some of the providers who haven't um, dipped their toe into this pond yet, and what are the incentives that that might bring them in? What are the tools or resources, this gets back to data. Um, you know, a lot of times, and you asked about data, you know, I've been spending a lot of time doing site visits across the country with accountable care organizations, meeting with providers and patients, and and this, the ACOs and the need for data to be able to be successful in these models. And there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of um, organizations out there who provide this information and data that's, you know, actionable and, and, and helps um, helps these organizations be successful, but what are, what about the ones without the capital yeah. um, to invest in these data? And yeah. how can we make sure that they've got what they need to be successful? So we need to bring on those um, those providers and see if we can bring them into the fold in a way that's sort of you know not going to break the bank and and really results in dividends, pays dividends for them. And so we're thinking about that question. Um, it has been easier to get providers at the primary care level into models, um, but we also don't want to ignore specialty care because that is where a lot of the spending takes place. It's where a lot of, you know, the Medicare population spends a lot of time. Um, and so we're thinking about how to bring specialists into um, into models over the long run. But, but keep in mind, our fee-for-service system is pretty, it works pretty well for specialists. Um, and, and I think the other thing we don't want to do is create a different model or a different payment system for every specialty group, because then we're just perpetuating the the, the sort of um, fragmentation that exists today. So it's really about that integration and thinking about that integration. This has been, as we expected, a, a just another outstanding interview. Liz, uh, we're all pulling for you. You're doing a great job. So keep up the good work and thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Gary. And thanks to all your listeners and Please reach out if you have ideas for us or or feedback. Uh, We welcome it. Super. Super.